Hello everyone, welcome to our top games of February 2024. This is March and this is already three months in, in 2024, but of course you don't need a reminder, you can count yourself. But hopefully you have been well, play lots of board games or not and do whatever you like. And hello, I'm Stella and this is Tarrant from Evil University. Hello. And so today we have a very, very, very tough job. Yes, it was uh, a it was a long February. It was a what? leap year this year. So <laughs> yes. it adds all these extra exactly. games and yeah. time for games that exactly. you wouldn't normally get in February. No, so no. the competition is twenty nine twenty eight more uh, aggressive this year for our February list. <laughs> no, but seriously, we played lots I mean, of lots of lots of great games. True. Mathematically, Theron is absolutely correct. I never say that you were wrong, honey. Hmm. But um, but it's seriously, <laughs> no, it's not and with good cause. <laughs> no, anyways, we have played lots of great games this month. So yes, quite a few prototypes. Uh, a few prototypes. Uh, yes. Are we interested to see a couple prototypes pop up in this? Countdown. Uh, because as usual, these are new to us games. They can be new to the world. They can come from last year. They can come from next year if they're prototypes. Uh, sometimes we're commissioned to do work, sometimes review copies and so forth. But this is our opinion on totally. February. Totally. So as usual, we're going to go back and forth from you and me or whatever. And yep. then we will tell you from our number five. Taryn, what did you go first? Uh, sure thing. So number five for me was the uh, big new, big new Euro that is uh, out there on Kickstarter at out the there, time. Out there, up there. Yes, <laughs> at the time of discussing this, very popular on Kickstarter, Galactic Cruise. It was actually on the top or hotness of BGG. It was like number one and number two because Beach Night was number one, the expansion or whatever, yeah. at the time of filming. Yes. Well, you can probably guess when you film when we film this. Anyways. Yes, continue, Tara. Yes, so Galactic Cruise, it is, you know, it's a big, it's a very galleristy feeling uh, Euro game. I think that's normally how how I best describe it because it's very much got, it's got a hand, well, it's got 12 actions, but instead of eight, and it's got kick out bonuses. So it very much has that gallerist feel. And you're out there trying to find essentially good combinations of tiles which are going to give you uh, the best points and you want to get tiles that have objectives, you want to get enough advertisements and money to keep the actions going and to convert advertisements into points when you take people on cruises. And it's one of those games that you kind of like, okay, what do I need to go for first at the first play? But as you start playing, you start to understand, okay, so I need this for this. It's kind of like Lacerda feel. It looks a bit like Lacerda. I mean, the artist is Yon Utul, so it looks like a Lacerda game. And the box also that, you, I mean, that's Lacerda games, but then that's prototype. So I don't know what the, the actual box is going to be. As I very much has that feel. It felt a lot like the gallerist to me. Uh, but with fewer different ways of scoring. I think that's why for me it wasn't an outright classic Euro, it was just a good quality Euro, because it, uh, I felt that it didn't, it didn't have lots of different variety in how you could go about scoring. Uh, it all kind of funneled into these one, one or two rocket. different ways of scoring. Yeah. Funneled into one rocket. Well, um, that is Galactic Cruise. Yes. Well, my number five is also Galactic Cruise. I also enjoy it as well. It's not as heavy as Lacerda's game. So sometimes, you know, you want to play something lighter and then you feel like play something lighter like Lacerda. Like this is like Lacerda light, maybe? At least that's what I think or how I feel. So this has got this kick out action that's, I think, really fun. And it has this third player or third dummy player that is quite like it's very simple I wouldn't say quite very simple to do you basically just chalk out the board so that you get kicked out action or you kick out another player that way so that you can gain the well in Lacerda's game it's called executive action but this is like you kick out action you got this slightly not that great action but still not bad like little resource or little money or something like that Yes. And you can control it as well. You can c control your kick out action so you can upgrade certain things to have engine. You want to get a once off bonus, but then that's it. You don't build your engine or you can choose to build your engine. And that option is great for me. It was like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to 
to say, but in reality, it's I always like to get okay. I need four money straight away. I don't want like one money extra per income or whatever. Yeah, some of those early choices are very interesting because it yeah. does get tight. The resources get pretty tight at times. Yeah. Um, and getting that big influx of four early versus working on the, the engine build, mm -hmm. tough decision, impactful. And another thing that is impactful is because there is a race to the goal, the the goal for the points, the first player would only achieve like two things of that goal, for example, and then the next player would need to achieve three. So that's also, you know, contribute to that urgency to try to gain the big bonus up front rather than later. Yes. Yeah, I do like that. Uh, it gives you, because you can usually complete all the objectives, so taking it further away from your reach mm. yep. uh, when other players get there first. Again, yeah, urgency and um, it, it forces you to make tough yeah. decisions. That's, that's correct. So before I move on to the next one, if we do have the video related to what we're talking about, we'll put it in the description below. So for this one, we have a playthrough and we even did a parody video with Heron as a few characters there. Yes. It's pretty fun. And you as one mean character. Yeah, I know. That no nobody can pronounce the name. The mean ticket lady. Anyways, another one thing that I like about this game, obviously the theme. That's why we managed to make the parody out of it because the theme is just so fun. It's a cruise, but in the in galaxy, and they have rooms that you can build, and that's like board game convention room, board game show, or game show, game show yeah, room. Yeah, it's all sorry. the sorts of fun things you yeah. might find on a cruise that they try to upsell you on while you're on there. Mm -hmm. it has the jet bumpers? That's my favorite. That is dodging, your favorite. Dodging cars, but they've got like jet engines and they're flying around in three dimensions. Just uh, looks also known as the death chamber, I think. <laughs> It sounds horrific. Oh, anyways, that's Galactic Cruise. Well, this is Terrence number four, but I want to come out clean at the start. This is also my number four, Inventors of the South Tigris. At this time, it is about to go on Kickstarter. Yes, this is the third in the South Tigris series and the ninth in the overall of the Kingdom series mm -hmm. uh, from Shem Phillips and... Uh, Sam and McDonald as well. McDonald's. Yes. And funny enough, we also did a little parody for, for it. Yes. This is, I would say, this game, it's probably, it certainly took me the longest to teach out mm -hmm. of all of the games. It's got a lot going on. Um, and it has, it has the classic sort of uh, you know, detailed personal puzzle that all the other South Tigresses have had in terms of being a dice pool management, dice worker placement type of thing. So there's a lot of personal stuff going on, but what I like, which elevates this one, and probably makes it my favorite of the South Tigra series, I is think. it does add more interaction. Yeah. It's got a series of worker placement spaces, which kind of have a Terra mystica feel in that they're often going to get snapped up quite early. And it has a little bit like Wayfarers and um, Scholars as well. It has shared things. In this case, it's shared devices that you're inventing, building and publishing. And when you do things, they'll give you benefits. They might give the inventor benefits. They might give the builder benefits. And so that's all kind of interlocking. And even though you're not going to... Uh, it doesn't, ha that part of it doesn't really have that interaction where you are worried someone's going to take something away from you. Yes. It does add this positive player interaction, which is quite nice. That is the word, positive player interactions. We've seen kind of like the trend the last a couple of Garfield games or Arcus games, because Shem now also part of Arcus games. So part of a couple of games that's designed by Shem Phillips has got positive player interactions. So another player benefiting from your actions. Yes. So that's actually a great addition. I mean, compared to take that or, I don't think there is such thing as negative player interaction. Or is it? Or just call take well, that. that. Is take, that. take that, yeah, that's it. So that is, that is great, that is so positive. That's kind of mm -hmm. like feel good feeling. So that's, that is why I like this one as well. You can, for example, well, obviously you are inventors and you build blueprint and then you build it and then you publish it and then in between, you can optionally testing it. It's so fun as well. I was like, okay, you don't have to test it. 
you optionally can test it. You can just build it, it'll be fine, and you can test it later as well. Yes. After publishing. After publishing. But for example, the builder, if they publish their invention or they build it and then they publish it, sorry, they get less points than if you publish it and then another player publish it. Yeah. Like things like that. And the theme, I mean, this is like sort of in line with Galactic Cruise when it has like different rooms, different funny rooms, and this is fun inventions. Yes. The so name is great. Names are great because you've got uh, boards which have adjectives on them and you've got cards which have devices, so you end up with fragrant beacon and spinning helmet, trick bowl, trick bowl and things like that. Yeah, we even like made it up for our other videos. Mm. Self-regulated board games. <laughs> Anyways, this is a fun game. If this is slightly different, that I either way, I always I always love Garfield games. Games slightly more interactions in here rather than the previous one, and that's why you alluded to it as well. That's why Taryn likes it more than the other mm. the other ones. You tend Taryn tends to like more interactions. Yeah, and this is probably. Would it be the heaviest of the... I would think so. Certainly by rules load. By, I yeah, think it's yeah. the heaviest of heaviest of all. Really. I think I think Terrence How to Play is the longest, though, that probably... It was certainly the longest How to Play I've done for a, um, for for a Garfield. Title. For Garfield? Yeah. Not even the the war game. Oh, yeah, Circadians. Chaos. Chaos or yeah, yeah, that's that probably was. the longest. That was longer, but because that had asymmetric. high asymmetry. Yeah. And, but it wasn't that far short of it. There is okay. There are quite a lot of things going on. If you mm. like that personal puzzle element. Mm -hmm. This has quite a difficult one. And yeah, so yeah. that I think that will make this quite popular. Yeah, I think so too. So everyone, hopefully I edit this video and publish it close so you can be like, oh yeah, go check it out. Rather than like, oh no, I um I edited it like one month later and then it's now April and then Stella just published the top games of February. Has happened before. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Alright, next. All right, continuing the theme of games you can't buy because they don't exist yet because they're prototypes. <laughs> uh, here we have my number three, which is the Call of Cthulhu Horror on the Orient Express board game. Let me rephrase that a little bit. You can't buy, but you can back. You can back. You can back. So at least there is something. But you're right. Sorry, we'll we I'm will come sorry. with some game actually. Yes. No, I, no. I, I will have one game for you that exists on the market. <laughs> well, are they out of print, though? No, no, I'm sure it's oh, in yeah, print. Okay. I yeah. think it's oh, in print. Okay, we'll Anyhow, see. so this is, I think this one's not coming out till next year. It's a mm -hmm. really big one. This is uh, a cooperative, it's a new cooperative, very narrative rich story game by Adam Kvapinski and Gorb Gorbioski. And this. Is that big? So this is, you can really tell, sorry, yes, it is a, as big as your head. I shall acknowledge this. Thank you. <laughs> so oh, are you trying to say I have, I'm big headed? Let's just side swipe and stuff. Okay, yeah. yeah. There <laughs> so it is the new big theme rich, but not narrative rich, very Euro feeling cooperative game from the designer of Frostpunk and Nemesis probably the simplest way to describe it. And you can really feel, you can feel it's got the same designer because it's hard and there's like eight ways to die. Mm -hmm. um, in this game, you are on, <laughs> you are on the Orient Express, you're investigators, standard Cthulhu sort of thing, and you're trying to survive to the end and find out enough information about the potential cultists to identify them. And so there's a little bit of logic deduction there. It's mm -hmm. a little bit of luck as well, but it's a little bit of logic deduction. But then there's all sorts of horrible things going on around you. You've got passengers getting killed by cultist spells and monsters and vampires. You've got passengers being driven insane by cultists and vampires. That causes portals to open, essence to go into play. So it's so many things, on. heaps coming on. This would have been my top games as well if I didn't play a lot of... I did tell you, I did warn you, it's a tough game in February and Taryn did warn you with the 28, 29 days. Yeah. But it's probably sitting on my number six. It's a great game. And I do like my puzzle deduction. Yeah, you know, a couple of the things that really stand out, something I've, I've really found with Adam Kopinski's games is the way he is really good at bringing these Euro sort of mechanisms 
in that fit the theme and that are different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this one, yeah, you've got these little train cars and they have curtains. Oh, and you, so can, cool. you can take an action to slide the curtains. And if you open the curtains, you can do more stuff. You can, like, cast spells on monsters outside. Mm -hmm. But the passengers can see more stuff outside, so they're more likely to get driven insane. Mm. But then if the curtains are closed, the vampire can come in and do his thing more violently. Um, everything is bad, everything is hard. Yeah. I mean, not bad in a bad way, but just like in difficulties to beat the game. Yeah. The other one I really like is the pushing mechanism. This is something I've not seen before. You imagine the train is speeding through the yeah, landscape, yeah. and one of the ways to fight the monsters is to push them. And they essentially fall backwards towards the back of the train equal to the speed of the train. So you think of it as, all right, well, if I go faster, and I disrupt the monster, then it's more likely to tumble yeah. away from the back and be out of, yes, out of yes, trouble. Yes. And that's, that's just so thematically good. And then one of the ways of losing is the train loses all its speed, and then just all the monsters who are running catch and flying up. after you catch up and just eat the train. <laughs> well, there's another pushing mechanic where you, you found out that who the cultist is as part of the logic, logic puzzle deduction, that you can push that person out. Yes, I like that because it doesn't help you win at all. It's just yeah, fun. It's just fun. <laughs> Well, it does it oh, no, helps you yeah. a little bit, but yeah, you don't yeah. need to do it. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, as I say, you can very much see the see the designer. It's going to be a large box game. Is the thickness? I mean, What's going on? This is prototype, so I don't know how big. The... Oh, it'll be big. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there we go. Horror on the yes. Orient Express, my number three for yes. February prototype. Also, if this game is just maybe a little bit easy to beat. And it's probably gonna make my top five, maybe. It's like it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Mm. We died like all the time. But yes. you like the challenge, yeah. anyways. Yes. And I like the narrative. That's true. The story you can, the narrative in a nemesis way. The story you can tell about what's going on. This is my number three: the Veil of Eternity. Eternity. Yes. <laughs> this is a card drafting game and tableau building game. It where is on the market. It is on the market. Okay, yeah, Taryn promised it. Mm. And it's also on Board Game Arena. What? That what? is true. Yeah, so you can easily access it. It's like, oh yeah, I like... I mean, you haven't heard what we're going to say yet, but if you like what you hear here, it's like, okay, go on Board Game Arena. Pretty sure it's free, I'm not too sure. I might be wrong, but just find somebody that is a member of Board Game Arena and then play with them. So this is an open drafting card game and also a tableau building game where the favorite things that I like, I'm going to go straight to the point, is the combo of the cards. You're looking for that broken combo of the cards. The cards are actually a mythical creatures. You're hunting monsters, you're monster tamer, you need monsters, you've got to catch, catch them all. No? Yes? No. Anyway, and you need to put together a set of monsters that works the best for you and there's so many varieties and they're all the mythical creatures of the world it's like it's truly like oh yeah i've seen the i've recognized this one this is like um the greek uh, gods or this is the japanese monster or something like that it's, it's so cool like that and um, artwork is great and yeah that combo is really great like you need to get the right card and because it's open drafting and it's a snake draft, you get two cards each round, you can block other people if you think that, oh no, that's going to combo with that person's too much, I'm going to block it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's important that way because there's a, there's a limited set of cards. There are some really powerful combos yep. in there. And as you are drafting them, it is a snake draft. Uh, there are there are some attacking cards. There are some cards that let you remove That's correct. other yes, players yes, yeah. really strong. Probably like necessary. Characters. Yeah. Um, and there are there are ways that you can. You know, it's it's got that space basic thing where there's ways of getting lots of little points on going. There are ways of building up to big chunks of points. Right. Uh, interesting combos. Yes. And um, if you've been enjoying these vlogs or this video, if you can please please. Hit the like button and let us know what you've been up to, what games you've been playing, what great games you've been playing and you can recommend to us. Uh, that will be much appreciated. And this is probably an opportunity for me to talk about what's been happening with us, what are we up to. We are going, we're not going to Gamma. Well, I mean, we didn't go to Gamma. I just booked my flight to Gen Con. Oop. So I will be at Gen Con 
we've booked our flight to Essen, so me and Taryn are going to Essen. Yeah. And I am going uh, in Australia. I think I will make it to PAX Australia because it's on the same, sorry, on the different weekend than Essen Spiel. It's on the subsequent weekend. Subsequent you're, weekend, yeah. You're really trusting your ability to not be jet lagged. I don't know. Yeah, I might just like crash and burn and that's it. Uh, don't count on me being in PAX Australia. But the next one I'm going is PlayCon. So PlayCon is by Boykin Barbecues, also a media in Australia. So they have their podcast mainly and they also have been doing meetups. So game meetups, they have their board game day in Melbourne, Brisbane and Sydney. So this is the first one, the biggest one of, so the first one of the biggest one, I think, with few sponsors like Little Games, Sport and Dice, and I know Phil Walker Harding is going to be there, SJ McDonald, aka Sam McDonald from Garfield Games is going to be there, and just a few other people that, you know, a few of my friends are going to be there, so I can't wait to go to the play card. It should be fun. Taryn won't make it though. I won't make it this time, but I'm going to Essen, so. Yeah. Yay. All right. Next game, Taryn. Okay, so the absence of a box means we're uh, in another prototype. Yeah, another How prototype. How could you? How dare you? You just like teasing people and it's like, oh yeah, this game is great, but you can't buy it. This one's not even on BGG. No? I couldn't find it. Last time I checked, I couldn't find it either. Yes. So this is a game where, this is, this is, our, this is both of our number twos, by the way. Yes. So uh, we will talk together about I can't really complain about that because <laughs> I'll use mine as yes. well. <laughs> so this is a game that we saw called Fairy Ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, who published this one? Well, VR Distribution Australia is going to distribute it in Australia. Yes. I think it's part of Asmodee, but I could be wrong. I think it is. So this is a new, this is a different twist on a pretty typical drafting game. Yeah, um, yeah this, uh, it, on, the, on the surface, it's your standard drafting game where there's like five or six different types of cards and you take a card and you pass them on and you know sushi go did it seven wonders did it mm. you know make, making sets things like that how this one is going to work is that you create a tableau an ordered tableau in front of yourself and it creates a ring that goes around the table and the card you play dictates how far you move and then the card you land on dictates uh, what gets resolved. What, yeah, what gets and, resolved. And points is what you want. Yes, and your opponent... So if you land on your opponent's uh, stack of a certain type, yes. that stack resolves for that player, and the equivalent stack, if you have it, resolves for you. Yes. So, oh, so good. <clears throat> by the end of the game, it's going to take you lots of time to get around the loop to get back to yourself. So you want to try to time things up so that you're landing on different players' spaces, giving them some points, giving yourself more. More points, and hopefully. It was just a really interesting play. Yeah, it's like we we all enjoyed enjoyed it. It's it's amazing, it's it's very light, the rules is really easy, but then timing your card you, when you're gonna play this, and you can play it on your left or on your right, is gonna stuff up other people's turn, because you're counting, this means that your fairy may be over there, that means that this is the card will dictate your fairy will move this many amounts, it should land there and it should give me this, hey! But if you're not the first player, other people might play another card in between and make your counts off and you didn't end up where you want to land on. Yeah. That's really fun. Yeah, I think, like I came out of it feeling like it wasn't a perfect game, like maybe it was still in prototype, there were a couple things it stronger than others. It was still in prototype, others. yeah. Um, but I just, and... Not because you got demo uh, demolished. I did get demolished. <laughs> and it does, it does take a fair bit of focus because there's one card where you score every time it passes your yeah. thing. Yes, and, I knew you, you know, were going to Yeah, and like we were playing... <laughs> We were playing in a four-player game and there was someone well-known for like thinking about things who just missed it pretty much every single time that went past. It was a lot of reminding. So you do have to keep focus on the game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just, I just really, that also kept people in the game, which was good. So as long as yes. everyone's focusing, yes, yes, it yes. works. Yeah, because you're like, oh, okay, which, where's my fairy? It could be like here, it could be there. You have yeah. to make sure you know where it is and then time, time it right. Yeah. So it was a really nice, different twist. I yep. liked it. Yeah, me too. I can't wait for it to come out and then show you, hey, this game is actually real, you know, <laughs> just like, there's nothing here, but I'll, I'm showing you the photos, so it is real. Yeah, yeah very ring. 
And so to finish for me, my number one game of February is the as promised on the market game. We've already discussed it. The Veil of Eternity. Um, I really enjoy the combo making that you can do here. Oh, you smashed us. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> All the time. <laughs> and I remember initially thinking, all right, there's... Yeah, there's 70 cards in the deck mm. and you'll get used to them all and you'll get used to the combos pretty quickly but that's where having it as an open snake draft really mm. works because yeah. you can be watching out for the dangerous things uh, it also adds a lot of power to the cards that let you draw blindly um, the biggest hook of this game i think the biggest thing that's clever is that there are magics part of the currency we didn't mention this before maybe there's, i said that for you Maybe you did. There's magic stones of value one, three, and six. And you can only hold four of them, and you're not allowed to freely exchange. It's like one of these very rare games where I can't just give up three ones for a three because I gained them as three ones, and therefore it's going to take up more space in my inventory. So it just gives you this extra thing to think about. It makes you sequence the turns you're doing in a specific order so you never go above those four. Really clever. Yeah. Anyway, this is my number one of this month. <laughs> Mythwin. So what I just sang is the theme song of Stardew Valley, the video game. But Mythwin feels like Stardew Valley, the board game. Well, the board game version of the Stardew Valley, the video game, more than Stardew Valley, the board game itself. Yeah, Stardew Valley, the board game, was a co-op set in the Stardew Valley, the video game universe. Whereas this is a sandbox game that absolutely has the feel of a Stardew Valley style sandbox video game. And I absolutely love it. Mythwin is an open-ended sandbox game where you play one of the four characters which has got great save mechanics and so in between season like every nine round or so and then you get to another season then you can choose another character. So it's very calming. You're working together to build buildings, getting more resources, getting money, uh, fulfilling orders um, as a crafter or tending to your farm as a farmer or you know do with economic as a um, as a merchant and things yes. like that so it's it's just just amazing and just coming and artwork is great and totally feels like that like you go in an adventure as well there are times where you like oh this is really hard but then you need that challenge you need that ch a little bit of challenge as well and that's that's okay yeah, I've got to give real credit to the to the game design here. Often, you know, as we've played video game, open-ended video games, City Skylines, things like that, it's often got me thinking, gee, could a board game really work as an open-ended, um, completely sandbox type of game? And I just sort of came to the conclusion that it just couldn't effectively work because you would... You know, build something out way too big and then it would just, you would run out of things to do. But you can tell they've really uh, looked at how that sort of video game works mm -hmm. and designed it to fit perfectly. And you've got these little goals, little goals that you have a limited time to achieve. So it gives you a little bit of direction. Mm -hmm. You're constantly building up your skills so you can do things faster or better. So and every it's not time easy. you play that. Yeah. Yeah, so every time you play a season, as you progress, you're going to get to do a little bit more. And then events are going to come out, and that will tell the story. It's exactly how one of those sandbox video games works. Yes, the event card is like this thick. I don't know, it's just very thick. Yeah. And then that goal, it's not that hard if you don't receive, uh, achieve the goal. And the engine build that you can do, it's like... It's really hard, it's really slow going, but then I think that's what you need for a, a really long game. So kind of like forever game. Yeah, the <laughs> I mean, the first thing the rule book says is this game has no ending. You play until you Music feel you've achieved everything, <laughs> yes. essentially. There are also envelopes as well in the in the box, so yep. uh, the things, the secret team. Things, things to unlock, in. things to change it up. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it saves. You know, that's the other thing that I thought could never work in a sandbox board game, but you can save the game. Yeah, it's so in, easily in a minute, really. Yeah, just put 
it's all double layer boxes. Just put it all away. It's not just double layer boxes. Trays and trays. Yeah, yeah, the trays are really great. They're like they're awesome, and they're functional as yeah. well when you play and to s store your stuff. It's great with him. Have you played it? Did you back it? I know that they're running another Kickstarter. I think like a second print run. I think so. Yeah, it's really great. I really like. Is it gonna be on Board Game Arena? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. I don't think. I can't see that. I mean, not sure that. Would you know, you know, you know that would be funny because it's like the open-ended video game transformed the board game, and then there's a digital adaption of it. Like, how does that work, right? It's like from that to board game back again to digital. It does feel like it's defeating the point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, Smithwin. Hopefully, you've enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching, everyone, and have a great day. Bye.